All right, welcome everybody. My name is Frank McKenna. I'm here at UC Berkeley. I'm working for the Neary Sim Center, which as you just heard is a National Science Foundation funded project. And I'm gonna be presenting day one of a QOFAM tool training workshop. Um, uh -oh. So the outline of the workshop, I'm going to be talking about an introduction to Simpson Center, who we are, what we do. Then I'm gonna be showing you some research applications we've developed and released. Um, we'll talk about some educational software. And then I'll go into to QOFAM itself, and that's where the majority of this um, presentation is going to be spent. So the leadership group, who leads Sim Center? Well, the PI of the project is Professor Sanjay Gavinji here at UC Berkeley. The Sim Center itself, um, there's basically two co-directors, Professors Deerline and Gavinji are the two co-directors. Um, and there's a lot of input from our senior, the co-PIs, Professor Kareem, Lowe's, and Rao. Matt is the co-director and I'm just in charge of software development. So here is my software development team, basically mostly made up of postdocs, but we do have some uh, professors who can actually program. Um, so they are the postdocs and they do the programming. And then who tells us what to program and if it's working right? Well, they, that's our domain experts. And we have a bunch of them across all the, the different fields in, in natural hazards. So now the question is, where does Sim Center actually fit in the Near East sphere? Um, we have experimental facilities, the Rapid Facility and Design Safe. We consider ourselves a virtual experimental facility, and what we do is produce software that runs at Design Safe um, and can be downloaded from Design Safe. That software is intended for people outside Near East, but you know, people working in natural hazards engineering. It's practicing engineers and research people such as yourselves. Our mission is tra to transform natural hazard engineering through advanced computational simulation. As Steve Mahan said, it was, it's grounded in the present. It is a five-year focus, but it's a 20-year vision. So what do we mean by transform transformational software? Where, where do we get the ideas as, as to what software to do that will transform natural hazard engineering? Well, these all came from the Grand Challenge reports. Um, there was six of them back in the early 2000s. And if you read through these reports and you look at well, what, what software they do, they do they think people need, they all came up with you know, similar things. Basically, the software should produce UQ in the response. Um, we need to do performance-based engineering, not just for earthquake engineering. We need applications that do com community resiliency, that is, look at large regions, and finally, we need to educate our students. We need educational applications. Now, the requirements that we, as we go forward with our project and have released software, new features that go into the software, those ideas come from you, the community. So if you do have any ideas, do post them on the, the message board we showed you at the start. Um, if you look through some of them, for example, the QuoFem and the EUQ, some of the feature requests, you know, they've already been, been, been being implemented and they're, they're in the current version of the tool you're using now. So we do respond to those feature requests and put them in. So what are our goals? Well, basically, what are we doing? We're developing an open source framework for actually building what are called scientific workflow application systems for natural hazards engineering that take into account uncertainty quantification. Um, we're designing the framework to be flexible, extensible, and scalable. We're seeding the framework with data and interfaces to existing tools. We're not developing you know, new finite element applications ourselves. Um, we're releasing these tools and applications built using the framework. And finally, we're trying to provide through all the software pro we're providing through our message board, an ecosystem that fosters collaboration among researchers. If researchers are all using the same software, if they're contributing to the same software, it grows and it feeds upon itself. Um, as the person who developed OpenSeas, I, I know this to be true, to be a fact. So what are scientific workflow systems? So here's two little definitions. A scientific workflow system is an application that allows you, the user, to build, launch, and monitor scientific workflow applications. So what's a scientific workflow application? Well, that's just, sort of the automation 
of a process in which information is passed from one application to the next. So what does that mean? Basically, as the figure on the left kind of shows, we're chaining applications together. So software moves data from, from one application to the next. Like it's not you, the user, having to take the output of one program, manipulate it and get it ready for the input to another. Basically, the software does that for you. Now to do that and use existing software, we basically have to create pre and post processors to existing software. And we also want to use the HPC resources that DesignSafe provides and also their storage system. So this is the current um, SimCenter framework. These are the components I was talking about down here. We have a number of different components. And then these are these scientific workflow systems that we're releasing. Um, here's QuoFem that we're talking about today. QuoFem is using, say, two of the components in our, in our framework. EEUQ, which builds upon QuoFem, but also takes into account structural analysis modding, modeling and earthquake event simulation. PDE builds upon EEUQ again, um, but just brings in some damage and loss calculation and a database for damage and loss. And then finally, our RDT, our regional tool, will build again upon PDE, um, but we'll look at databases, for example, containing the built environment. What are the housing stock? What are the building stock in, in an area? And for that, we're using software called Rails that we're developing to actually try and build up these, these databases of uh, building inventories. So the first thing about our software systems is they are not running deterministic workflows. You run an you, for example, you do not get a single output um, for every response parameter. Instead, the, the workflows are UQ. For each output response, you get information on the response and some measure of uncertainty in the computer response. For example, you're gonna get a mean and a standard deviation for every response quantity. Now, the fact that we're bringing UQ to all our applications requires extra input from you, the user. The user has to both identify the parameters as being random variables, and then the user has to define the distribution associated with these random variables. So we're no longer coming in and say E is 29,000. You have to, for example, say E has some distribution, maybe normal. Its mean is 29,000 and the standard deviation is what? You know, 3,000, whatever. You have to start looking up that information, but you have to define it and bring it into the program. Now all this UQ, it's like Monte Carlo type simulations. They require an awful lot more simulations. So there's an awful lot more computations involved. Now our workflow systems, they run in either your local desktop machine, in which case they use, utilize all the cores as they run, or we can actually run them at, at DesignSafe on their HPC systems, specifically Stampede 2, and upcoming they'll be putting us on their Proterra system. Now a consequence of the fact that we want to run the backend application or the, the application it, on the local machine or remotely we have to split the application into two. We've got the front end user interface, and then we have the back end workflow. So the front end user, user interface here is QuoFem. This is basically what you interact with. You, know, you build your workflow, you launch it, um, and you get you see the results. So at the back end is actually where all the work is done. Um, the UI generates basically an input file for this backend and it starts the backend and then the backend does all the work. So now let's look at the SimCenter research applications that we've already released or are about to release. So we have four out right now. First one, QuoFem, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I won't pretty much spend any, any time on this, but basically it integrates simulation applications with uncertainty quantification engines. Our earthquake engineering app, basically we're trying to quantify the building response when a building is subjected to an earthquake. Um, and the focus here really is on how do we get the earthquake events to excite the building? How can we alleviate some of the, the pain you must you go through to actually pick the earthquake events um, for your buildings? Wind engineering applications, similar to earthquake engineering, except now we're looking at wind forces on a building. 
where are these, we getting the wind forces? We can do doing experimental test, the wind tunnel test data, or we could be doing a full blown CFD simulation using open foam. Finally, our PVE application. Basically, what is the damage and loss of a building subjected to a natural hazard? Currently, the tool is, does it for earthquake events. Um, by the end of this year, we hope to be moving to other hazards, for example, wind initially. And finally, here's a tool we'll be releasing this year. It's called RDT. Um, and it's, this is the one where we're going to be do the, doing the regional simulation. It's a, it'll be a graphical, more graphical tool. You'll pick a region and then you, you know, what building inventory do you want to pull from? Um, what sort of a, events do you want to look at? And then we'll run the simulation. And all these simulations will probably be running at Design Safe, um, just for the, just the amount of computations involved. But let me tell you, this tool is just bringing up a host of uh, research opportunities um, where young faculty can, can get involved. Now, quickly in the the educational software we're releasing. Um, right now, we have four tools out: MDF and EVW. MDF is a building response for an earthquake. Um, EVW is the same thing, but it compares what would happen in an earthquake versus wind event. They're recorded for the classes in dynamics, and they're being used in dynamics classes. And then two on the right, we have a pile group tool. Um, this is a geotechnical tool for looking at how the forces get into the piles when it's loaded. And then our brace frame modeling is used in steel design courses. Um, basically, it shows you how to model a, a buckling frame brace. Finally, other educational things we do, we do our tool training workshop, of which this is one. And I'm sorry we can't be doing this in person because normally we, we spend a lot of time going through the, the examples with the students that, that show up. Um, this summer we'll also have a programming boot camp. This again will be an online event where we show students and professors how to actually write code. And then finally, next year, not this year, the summer REU program. So that's um, Sim Center. So now let's get into the to meat of today's presentation. Basically, it's an introduction to the Quilfan application. And I'm breaking this into a number of little steps. The first step, I'm just breaking into a, a quick tool walkthrough to just show you how the tool kind of runs. Um, then I want to show you how it works at the back end. Because if you start having problems with this tool, um, it's to the back end you will go um, to have a look at what's going on. And I just want to show you how that works. And then finally, we'll go through the different options available on the tool. So before I start, let me leave this up here. Um, <laughs> if I was rewriting Open Seas again, <laughs> I would make it so that every time I, you ran it, you'd get a different answer, just like what it happens in a typical building or an experiment. Every time you do an experiment, you get a different set of results. Um, so here's a, a famous quote from a guy called Jeffries in 1967. The uncertainty is as important a part of the result as the estimate itself. An estimate without a standard error is practically meaningless. Basically, you do deterministic simulations where only looking at um one single output quantity it's the results are they're meaningless unless you know something about the the the, the estimate itself you know the the standard deviation in that response the, the information you really need to know so quofam this is what quofam addresses basically it combines finite element applications with uncertainty applicant you q applications behind a real simple user interface um, we're just doing basic use Q stuff in this tool. Um, year four updates are, we'll be bringing in much more sophisticated UQ methods. But for right now, it's just, it's basic methods that are available in a program called Dakota. Um, you see here in my little figure showing the current capabilities. Basically the final element applications we can take in are OpenSeas, Pi, Feet, PV, and OpenSeas. Um, the different uncertainty quantification Methods available are the problem types, or that we got sampling sensitivity, reliability, parameter estimation, and Bayesian calibration. And then each of these methods have a number of additional algorithms they, the user gets to choose from. And we'll go through that, the, those today and again tomorrow. 
Today we're going to be dealing with the sam sampling sensitivity and reliability, and then tomorrow we get into the parameter estimation and Bayesian calibration. So now I thought we'd do a quick demo of the tool. And the idea in this demo is basically to show you the interface. You know, well, what are the different parts of the interface? And then demonstrate it running with the file in those example folderized. How'd you look? That's available now online. It's in the, the files I'm going to be running are in this tickle one directory. If you want to follow along, and you're able to install the QuoFem. Um, I'm going to run through the example. The example is basically finding the min, mean distance between two random points on a line between zero and one. Um, and then we're just going to do some of the, look through some of the things on the tool. So let me end the show here for a second and bring up QuoFem. I can find it on my. Desktop here. That's not the one I want. No, this one seems to be open. I should open it from the start. Um, so let me open Quofem. Let me close this guy. This is the current one I was playing with. So this is open it from the scratch. This is what you'd see when you, you start it up. Matt, do you see my OquoFem on the screen? Can you talk to me? I do. Can you um, make it take up your whole screen? Yeah, let me do that. I I've got two screens going here. I just want to make sure it was on it. It's good. Okay. So this is QuoFem when it starts up. So basically on the left hand side here, I have my what I call the selection panel where you basically, you know, here's UQ inputs related to UQ. We click FEM where we go to our, into our FEM. We got a random variables tabs, quantity of interest. And then finally, when it runs, you'll, it'll bring you to the results tab. Down here at the bottom, we have a bunch of buttons. If we want to exit the tool, if we want to run the tool locally, it's you click on the run. And then options to run it at Design Safe or get the information from Design Safe. And then top right over here, we have a login button. Before you can do anything with Design Safe, you have to select the login. And then finally, if there's error messages and stuff, um, they pop up in this area here, in this little thing here. It's kind of hard to see um, on my screen with uh, the stuff WebEx is putting in, but that's where the error messages will, will appear. So let's run this example now for a small thing. So I'm going to use Dakota Engine. It's the only engine available. By the end of this summer, we will have more engines available. We're going to do a forward propagation problem. We're going to use Latin hypercube sampling. And I'm going to re reduce the number of samples down to 100. Um, then I'm going to go to the FEM panel. And that brings up my FEM thing, I've got basically three options that we mentioned earlier. We feed PV, open seas, pi, and open seas. And open seas is the default. And open seas, um, we have a number of options here we can, I'll get to later, but for right now we're gonna fill in both these fields. We're gonna go to that, um, tickle one and five. And here's this test.tickle. So I'm going to put in test.tickle from that tickle one folder. So there's, uh, yeah, the, uh, I renamed the folder. Uh -huh. So let's go back here and do it. That was in my cache, that last one, so why I couldn't find it. This isn't working. Actually, it did work. It's interesting. There it is. Yeah. So here's now the postprocess.tickle script for my postprocess script. I'm going to postprocess.tickle. Um, so here's my two random variables. 
um, A and B, it, it selected them if, out of that file. If you open up that file, you'll see that they have a PSET A and a PSET B. So it pulled in those two things and recognized them as random variables. And here I want to change the distribution with each one. I'm going to change it from a constant to a uniform. You can't leave it constant. So I'm going to select, you know, A goes between 0 and 1, and B goes between 0 and 1. So anyway, say they're, you know, they're, they have a uniform distribution anywhere on between zero and one on this, this number line. So that's what I'm pretty much entering here. I have two points A and B. They can any, exist anywhere between zero and one on the number line. And the distribution is uniform. For my quantity of interest, I'm going to say I want D, which is the distance. I just give it a name. So with that, I'm done. I can now run this tool. And there's the, the answer. D is 0.303, it's got a mean of 0.3037 and a standard deviation of 0.26. The mean should actually be a third. Um, if I increase the number of samples, for example, to 100, not 1,000, and run it again, I should get closer to a third than that 0.30. Let me run it. Well, I do have 100 samples. So let's have a look at them. So here's, here's the graphic part. We get a summary part showing the mean and the standard deviation. Um, and then we get information on the skewness and the kurtosis. Kurtosis is how, how, how the skewness is how skewed it is about from the mean. If the skewness was zero, it would be the curve would kind of be centered on the mean. Um, kurtosis is how it looks relative to a normal distribution. So here's run one and here's, here's the response. Now I can, by left clicking and right clicking with my mouse, change the columns that are displayed. Left clicking, you know, I'm in column A, it shows the, the y-axis. So for the y-axis, let's set that at D. So I'm gonna left click now in this um, D column. And then we can look at how D is changes with A. So right click brings up A here. Um, right click again, I see the results for B. And if I go into column D itself and both right click and left click, um, I can start seeing the cumulative density. And then if I let left click, I get the frequency. Um, and I can see why the results are so bad because if this was correct, you know, it, the distribution being right, I would have had a, it would be kind of a sloping down from um, all the points being very close to being um, far apart. Most of the points are close together and sometimes they're, they're far apart. They go towards the one. Like it's very rare you get a point at one and a point at zero is basically the thing. Um, so we can improve this by this. Let's see what a thousand does. Please just run it again. Just click the run button. Um, you see, as you start spending a lot of time on this, you get the spinning wheel of death. So now getting 0.33, so we're getting closer. You know, that's, that's getting pretty good. The standard deviation should be a six. That's the exact solution. We can go and look at our data values. We have a lot more data values now. I can look at the, you know, a left click and right click in D here. Um, I start seeing a smoother curve. So it's a right click to get the, the CDF and then a left click again. So there's that, I'm starting to see my, you know, lots of points close together and then rarely do you get points, you know, zero and one. And then we can also look at the, how, how the distribution of B is. You know, there's a cumulative, but if we look at the, you see, we see we're getting a, our sort of, we specify the uniform distribution, and that's kind of what we get here. We can change, we'll quickly change that. Let's look, let's look at something else. Let's say a normal, it's centered about 0.5 and give it a 0.2 standard deviation for B, just to show you that the, the numbers change.
So there's our, you know, B has got that more normal distribution. A is still our uniform distribution. Again, just right click and left click in the column to, to bring it up. So let me exit the tool now as I'm running a bit behind. Back into the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so that's the tool. So now I thought we'd show how it actually works. So if you're trying to debug this at home, what's going on with my system? Why isn't it working? So as I mentioned before, we have a front end and a back end. The front end is the UA. That's what you're playing with. That's what I was just, you know, I was working through all this. I never realized that I have a back end thing running at all. Everything was done in this front end. Um, but the back end is where all the work is being done. I've got this UQ engine running it multiple times, running my finite element application multiple times to get those statistics. Um, what is actually happening is this UQ engine is actually running a, what's called my workflow driver, which is a, basically it's a, it's a bash script, just tells it, or a, a bat script if you're on Windows, um, telling it what to do for each invocation. So the UQ engine passes that driver, what's called a params file, which tells it for this deterministic run, these are the parameters to use, and then the workflow driver, when it's done, has to return the, re the results to Dakota so that Dakota can bu build up the samples or the build up the statistics. So the results have to come back in a results.out file. Oh, this guy. <laughs> so this is a fun one. Basically, this is what happens when you click run. Um, it's here basically for your information. You really don't have to understand it too well, but I'll go through some of these files. So the first thing it does is it reads from what's called the workflow applications file. That's to figure out which um, backend application to run. If I had more than UQ engines than just Dakota. So once it realizes, hey, I've got a UQ engine, it then writes the output file. Remember the user interface is just writing an input file for the, the UQ engine. So it just writes that input file. Currently it's called Dakota.json. Once the input file has been written, the user interface basically then launches this backend application. So this is the backend application that's getting launched with the input file, decoder.json. Now the first thing the imp this parse decoder does is it writes or what's called the input file for decoda, which is decoder.in, and it also writes out the workflow driver, this file here that decoda is going to use. Finally, then the what the um, application will do, it'll actually launch decoda. Then it launches Dakota um, with this input file it created. And it, the input file will have a link to where this workflow driver file is. And then Dakota will just run. It'll just send the params into this workflow driver, take the results out. And then when Dakota is done, it writes to the Dakota.out file in the Dakota tab. Um, it closes. Parse Dakota is then notified that it's closed. And then Parse Dakota then tells the the user interface said, hey, I'm done. And then what happened is the user interface is just reading these two output files. Okay. So I'm going to go back to another demo. I'm just going to demonstrate that. Um, and I'll just run another example quickly. This example um, is in the trust tickle one directory. And I'm going to, all the results when it, when it runs, it runs on my computer. It's going to run it on your computer. It's going to all the temporary files that it creates are going to be put in your documents folder under the application name, which is QuoteFam. Um, because we're running it locally, it's going to be in this local after. And then I've got a temp, temp sim center folder directory. So again, let me break out of the presentation and get back to QuoteFam, which I think I closed. Let me start it up again. OK, so here's QuoteFam again. We don't really care too much about the results, so we're just going to do 20 simulations because we're really looking at what the back end is doing this time. So let's see if we have more luck this time with choosing the file. Let's go over here. Didn't pop up. If you use a directory enough, it, it gets into your frequently used. So I said I was going to do trust, trust tickle one directory. In my QuoteFem examples, I have this trust 
and use that as my input. And this time I've got another post-processing script. So I'm gonna to go to my random variables and see if I have a bunch of random variables to define this time. Well, I'm just going to make up numbers here because I don't have them in my head what those are supposed to be. Um, but I do know the mean should be 25. <laughs> Just make that five. Another normal distribution. Upper was 500. Um, area is usually pretty good. Let's make that 15. Normal 250. If you want to start looking mean and standard deviation, um, if you go back to the early work of Galambos for the LRFD, um, he actually does come up with a lot of tables for uh, mean and standard deviations for a whole bunch of, you know, E and areas of the material, uh, areas of cross sections. Um, quantity of interest. So here I'm going to enter node underscore three underscore capital disp underscore two. Um, so basically I'm looking for node two displacements in the two degree of freedom direction, which just happens to be the vertical. And while I'm on it, why don't I add a second one? We'll also look at the two degree of freedom direction. So let me go run this now. So I'm gonna come down here. I've entered all my quantities. I come down and I select run. And there I go, we, there we have the answer um, pretty quickly. Again, if I wanted to, I can go back into my graphics and start playing around. Out of these, as you see, it's you know we really don't not getting we haven't done we've only run ten samples, but it's not bad. I should show you this with if you want. I suggest you play with this a little bit, but go have a look what Latin Hypercube or sorry Monte Carlo would give you for ten samples. You'll see you will not get anything that starts to resemble a, a normal curve. So let me um, I can leave that right there. Actually, why don't I just exit to clean up the screen? Okay, so I know told you the stuff would be in this desktop or documents folder. Documents, um, it's in Quofam. So let's look here. Um, I just wanted to show you something. There is a debug log dot file here. Every time you run Quofam, it will create a little debug log. So there'll be information that we're squirreling in, around in here um, that will help us later to say, look at your messages, see what's going on. So if you've got a problem, you might be able to send this, you know, the decoder.log or debug log, log file, and we can help you um, figure out what's what's going on. So now we're going to go into this local there. Um, you will only see one thing here, temp.simcenter. And here we have it. So I told it to run it for 20, 20 samples. And here, you know, I've got a basically decoder for every sample. We'll create a work there. And in that worker, it will run the simulation. So all the results will be in here for these different simulations. Um, where the program actually works is in templater. Um, so what templater has, here's the, here's the decoder.json. That was our input file. If I look, if I cat this file, um, you know, here's where I, do, you know, this file is readable. It's in JSON format. Um, it's basically at the top, it's telling me I'm using, the application I'm using is Dakota UQ. I've defined two EDPs. These are my quantity of interests, quantity of interest. No three displacement two, no two displacement two. Um, these are the options I provided for my sampling method. I was using Ford propagation, Latin hypercube, 20 samples, and that was the seed. Um, here's the information about the Fenelma stuff. The program was open seeds. Um, the directory the files were in, and I, this was the main input and the post-processing script. And then I have information about the random variables. And then we squirrel some other information in here too, like this remote after. Tells us when we're running this, it design safe, you know, where the, the current um, backend applications reside. So that was the decoder.json file. Um, so this is the workflow driver file that it created the 
that when the Simpson or backend application that parsed decoder ran, it created, took in the decoder.json file, it created this workflow driver file, um, which isn't a lot. Basically, it's every time the thing runs, I'm going to invoke some application in our backend directory. Um, it'll take the parameters.in, some, tickle, some, some file, create an input file, the SimCenter input.tickle, and then it will run OpenSeas, and it will send the results to OPS.out. If there's anything in the standard error or the, the standard in, or the, sorry, the standard error or standard out will be piped to OPS.out. So if there's a problem with your OpenSeas run, you could be looking at OPS.out to see what it is. So it also created this decoder.json file. So that's in this top directory. This decoder.in file, sorry, decoder.in is this input file for Dakota. So this was always also created by that parse Dakota. And this basically is the input file that to run Dakota. Um, so it's taken our JSON file and converted it into the input needed for um, Dakota. And we're gonna be doing the same thing with these other engines as we bring them in. It, you know, they'll all see decoder.json and then they have to figure out, well, what's the input format for my, for my different UQ engine? And then we just create that input file and then we're gonna launch the application. Let me look quickly look at a workter. So this is every time it runs it. Um, so the file it runs, the tickle file, for those of you who open, understand OpenSeas, is this one here, SimCenter input.tickle. Actually, uh, let me show you something else. So more SimCenter input. So when I get ready to run, um, I create this file, RV file. So here's my P set, and here's all the random variables, the random variable E, P, A, U, and A naught. So these are defined as the random variables. And then when I run this, this SimCenter deep rep row that was in that workflow driver, the SimCenter deep prep row here, this first, this first command, it's taking the parameters that are coming in from Dakota, looking at this file and creating my OpenC script to run. If I now look at that SimCenter input.tickle, you know, the, 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 the E, the, the, those random variable values have been replaced by the actual number. And then this is just the file I run. Um, so I'm setting my list. So the post-process script will actually get this list of coming in of what node three and node two were. And then I just source trust.tickle and I source post-process.tickle. That how, that's how it runs. So let me quickly go back to the slideshow again. So now let's walk through the different options. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about forward problem or sampling. Um, sensitivity and reliability. Tomorrow, Adam's gonna demonstrate parameter calibration and the inverse problem, which is really Bayesian calibration. So the forward problem or sampling, basically we take some, we, the user defines some distribution of the random variables. They're going into our finite element application and the application for each quantity of interest that the user specified comes up, you know, just tells you what the mean, standard deviation, kurtosis, skewness, and then graphically, you could look at the CDF and the PDF. So it does that for every, um, every quantity of interest. The algorithms available are the standard Monte Carlo. Latin hypercube sampling, that's the, the one we, that's typically rec recommended for sampling. Um, we've also have important sampling. Important sampling, it kind of looks at, they're kind of more interested in the tails, so it tries to get information around the tails. And then we have our two sort of surrogate models. We have polynomial chaos and Gaussian process regression, where they will do some either Monte Carlo and Latin hypercube, somehow build a surface of what the response quantities are, and then they just they just ping that res, um, response response surface model, like many more times to get these quantities here. Sensitivities, basically, what we're looking at here is you know we're trying to figure out which of the input random variables affects the, you know, the quantity of interest. 
So we, we do this to find out, you know, is E affecting the response or is P affecting the response? Which, which one has the bigger impact? Um, the reason you might want to look at doing sensitivity before you go off and do a full blown Monte Carlo is, you know, you don't want to spend your time defining everything as a random variable because then it would take so much time. So you just want to know, well, what are the important random variables? Um, which ones affect the response the most? Um, so that's what you do a sensitivity analysis for. And for each of the outputs this time, you don't get the data points, you don't get you know, the mean and standard de deviation. You get a, what are called Sobel, Sobel indices. Um, and I didn't actually do this right, what the, the options are here. I'll fix that in the presentation later. And then the reliability method, that's a, again, it's what we're interested in here. We take the random variable, the random variable distributions in. And here, we're not, you know, we're not interested in this entire curve, what this entire curve looks like. You know, we pick points on, our, on, our, on, the, on the curve that we're interested in. You know, what's the probability that we're going to exceed A or exceed B in our, in our response? You know, that's, all, that's all we care about. You know, for example, what's the, what's the probability that my top store acceleration is going to exceed so many Gs? Um, you know, you don't care about the whole thing. All you want to care about is the probability of exceedance of something. And here we have um, two methods, the local methods and global method. And the lo local method was available as a typical form and swarm. Um, and by playing with options, you can have form and swarm or you can get it, you know, different things. And then we have this global method, which is really best for highly nonlinear responses. And we are looking at getting other global uh, reliability methods into the, the tool. So let's go demo again. So what am I gonna do this time? Again, I'm gonna look at tickle one and I'm gonna try to demo um, forward sensitivity and reliability. Let's see how I do. So I'm going to open this tool again. I have to. Uh, I don't have it on my desktop like I should. Told you all if how to do. So I have to. Okay, let's quickly go get this. Um, still not here. Let's tickle one again. Yes. Press process opens. So I'm going to do forward sampling. Run the variables again. So one, actually we've already done forward sampling. Why don't we skip this? Let's do something else. Well, well I need to forward sampling because I don't know what the numbers are. That's very good, but I'll show you this anyway. Um, okay, D. This is to 100 for the interest of time. And we'll run it. And we get some answers. Look at the data values. Um, so again, left click and right click. Again, you know, we're not too good in what our, our response, our frequency thing looks like. Um, so let's say we were interested in, you know, what's the chance of it exceeding, say, 0.44 inches? So let's do now a um, reliability analysis. We'll just do global. And what did I say? Well, let's do 0.33. I forgot what I just said I was going to do. Um, so I'm going to do a 0.33 as my um, response level. Now, sadly, I need, um, you have to enter these again. Nice little feature request is please, Frank, don't make me enter these numbers again. So let's run this, see how we do. So now we're again, we're running, um, 
reliability analysis where we're looking at well, what's what's the thing about 0.33 and we get that other the you know 55 percent here now i could enter multiple um we can enter multiple things here We're interested in the percent probability of 0.33 and then again at 0.45. Again, if you're do doing this at home and you're no time constraints, do more samples and you get better results. You have to do at least a thousand samples. So there we go, you know, 0.33, we get our 5.5 again, and now it's saying for 4.5, a 0.45 displacement, it's a, you know, we're up at 70% probability. Okay, so let's go back, uh, sensitivity now. Um, what can we do with sensitivity? Ooh. So again, I'm not gonna do too many. So for sensitivity, you have to do a lot. Um, So I'm just basically going to show you the results again. There's a feature request for anybody. Of course, everybody likes entering these numbers all the time. So this time we're doing a, let's, let's add, so let's have a little bit of fun. Let's add a dummy variable. So it's got dummy. This thing should have no impact on the thing. We'll give it the same ranges. So we're now, this time we're doing a sensitivity analysis. Um, Latin, Latin hypercube, we've got our typical variables, set D. The thing when you, if you go look at the, your local dir temps.sim center and have a look at the folders, you'll see you'll have an awful lot of folders, um, a lot more than 100, because when it does sensitivity analysis, it does a lot more samples than you, than you say. But you see that, you know, the dummy variable basically has no impact on the response. Um, a and B, you know, the, the, the total index is, you know, it's, they're about the same and they're, you know, they're both important in the, in the response. So that was um, three UQ things. So the three UQ options, oh shoot. Can I do this quicker? No. Sorry about this. Now we're going to look at the um, the options for the FDM. There are three. Remember we have three programs: OpenSea's PV and OpenSea's Pi. Um, I'm actually gonna, not going to do OpenSea's Pi given the time constraints. We're going to let Adam do that tomorrow. Um, he's, he's a big OpenSea's Pi advocate. So OpenSea's is basically, what I'm doing in this slide is basically showing you there's three ways to do it. So I've been using Tickle, Tickle 1 and so far. So Tickle 1, this is, this is what the file is. If there's a P set in there, A1, P set B2. And you see every time I load up test.tickle, if I go to the random variables, I'm gonna have A and B already loaded for me. And they're gonna have initial values that should be whatever these values are. Um, and then I've also this other file, postprocess.tickle, uh, which is just gonna open up that results.out. Remember, Dakota needs a results.out. So here we're opening up results.out. Um, we're putting the variable D into that file and then we're closing that file. So that's one way to do it. Um, there's other ways to do it. Another way I could have everything in the same file. So if I run tickle2, test.tickle, I would only specify that I've got a main script. I don't have to specify that I've got a post-processing script. Okay, so you would just leave out the post-processing script altogether um, and just provide this file and it will run. 
This one, test three dot tickle, I'm not even saying P set A and B. I'm just, I'm just saying that I'm gonna use dollar A and dollar B. So this will work, but the thing is, this one doesn't auto-populate those random variables. So when I go to the random variable tab, um, I won't have A and B. I've got to add the two variables, A and B, to that random variable tab. Um, and also, if I try to run this script without running Dakota, it's not going to work. Whereas if I run this script, it'll work. If I run these scripts, they'll, you know, they'll both work. This one here won't work. So that's the advantage of using either method one or method two to to write the script. Um, this, is, this is a good one. Um, and I like it because this post pasta script can be a tickle script or it can be a Python script. If we're dealing with OpenSea's output, um, not everything can be recorded easily. Sometimes you have to record, say, the entire time series. Say we're trying to get the, the base shear. I would have to record the forces at all the elements at the, the bottom story. And then I'd have to loop over those forces for every time step, figure out the base shear and then add them together and then find the maximum. Um, while doable in Tickle, it might be easier for those of you more comfortable in Python um, to, do it, to do that in Python. And another little trick, if you don't want to use Python, you can also use MATLAB um, if it's available on your, your, your local computer. You can actually use OpenSeas to start MATLAB. So if you follow this way, and instead of doing that, you had to do some post-processing. If you do so follow method two, you could actually get the thing, the script to actually invoke MATLAB, um, process the results files, and then do the simulation. So that's OpenSeas. And here's a more complicated example. This is what was in that trust.tickle. Again, I had this file trust.tickle, EP, and you know, these were the variables that it read in and we saw were pre-populated when we got to the RV tab. Um, here I'm opening up results.out, and basically based on the inputs, you know, node two, node two disk, node three disk. You know, I've written that in code, so basically I can look at any nodal displacement. I'm not stuck on one. These previous examples here, you know, I, the only output I could play with was D. I couldn't do any. Um, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to look at when I was running the script. But in these ones, if I write more sophisticated scripts, I get to do more interesting things when I define my quantity of interest. Um, and as I kind of showed you, I didn't probably mention it, but this list Q of I that's in here, if you go back and look at that, that um, SimCenter pickle file in the workflow driver, you'll see that I defined this EDP list. And then basically the script gets to use that EDP list when it's doing the processing. And then here's the same tickle um, trust example. Instead of tickle to um, post-process the output file, I'm using Python. So this is a Python script um, that will do the post-processing. So this, these two files are in trust2.tickle, trust tickle2. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna do this one. Um, I'm gonna quickly go on to feet PV. So we can also you know, run feet. So FEEP, in the FEEP input file, you can have a section on the parameters. So if I run the FEEP one with a QuoFem, it will read in these parameters. And then here's a post-processing script to um, do the same thing. Basically, it'll open up the, the FEEP output file, which we set it up that it's always going to be this, SimCenter out.txt. So it's going to open up that file um, and write the results that out. So the RV, the random variables, we have a number of different options. Um, I didn't show you in the tool, but I'll quickly start it again to show you something. But you can have a look at what the distribution you provide, what it looks like um, in the thing. And then finally, the quantity of interest. Um, you can add any name you want as long as it starts with a lowest, lowercase letter or uppercase letter. It cannot start with a number or other fun funky characters. Um, if you do that, you'll mess up probably the Tickle and the Python post-processors. And the Q of I is passed to the post-processors. The Python scripts, um, they get it in the input args. It's passed in the input arguments. The Tickle scripts, they get it as passed as that, that list. 
finally have a bunch of exercises for you to play with. I'm actually at the end of my time, so I probably won't. Well, let me show you one thing. Bear with me one second, two minutes and I'll be done. I just wanted to show you the Let me quickly show you this. Uh, why don't I do sleep just to, so, so if I'm going to use sleep, I have to change the, oops, hold on. You don't want to try and open a zip file. One, one word of caution or warning, it's in, it's, it's, there's a big warning flag in the documentation. Never put these files you want to run um, in your download desktop or your um, or your home folder. Always put them in subfolders like I have here. Uh, if you put them this in the home folder, what that what that user interface does is it copies all the files in that directory and subdirectories to that temp, to that templater folder. So if your input file was in the so your home folder, it would copy all your files on your system every time it tried to run Dakota. So Dakota would probably fail pretty quick. So here I'm setting up a normal distribution, whatever, 15. Um, but if this was a feature request from somebody. They wanted to see what the distributions look like. So again, you get to, to see what the different distributions look like um, if you want. And because I'm out of time, I'll stop that, um, stop this presentation and go back to the, the exercises I decided to see if you could all manage. Let's play from current slide this time. So the first one I thought we'd try and find, you know, we, instead of a line, let's repeat sort of that, the, the idea of the line, but let's try and find the, if we got two random points in a square, or a rectangle. That's the width of so the rectangle is one, the height is 0 0.6. Um, find, the, find the average distance between the two, or the mean distance between the two, any two points in that square. Um, if you can do that one, you know, let's do, do a forward sampling on this one, then let's do the um, reliability and from this, figure out the 75% probability level, and then do, a, um, do the reliability analysis, put in that number for the 75%, and see if you get the same, roughly the same answer. And then if once you got the rectangle, try, try a circle. Um, how do you pose the problem to get it done in a circle? And then add a W random variable like I did, make sure, see if you get to zero. And then for those of you who have an open seas model, um, try running that or try, try taking your own open seas model that you have and running it inside QuoFam and try and get some uncertainty quantification. Do some forward, get some forward sampling, do some forward, uh, do some sampling. Um, give me a mean and a standard deviation for, for your inputs. Okay. So with that, I'm done. <laughs>